yeah, I'm really glad to uh, be able to visit uh, Zuri Hack again. Uh, and I'm actually pretty proud to uh, uh, be able to give the key keynote here. Because I think uh, Zuri Hack is really becoming like an institution in, in the Haskell community. Um, it's really becoming a tradition. So it's really, really great to, uh, to give this talk. Um, so this morning I will talk about uh, LumiGuide. It's a company I work for. And we are a Haskell shop. Um, and in this talk, I would like to introduce our company, what we do, what problem we solve, uh, how we are using Haskell. And uh, so the first part of the talk is kind of not really technical. The second part is really technical. And we are trying to like do a little live coding session with my brother who is sitting here in front. Um, and uh, yeah, so that should be fun. Also dangerous, but yeah, I like that. Um, OK, so who am I? Um, uh, I've been really fortunate to uh, be able to use uh, function programming, especially Haskell, throughout my whole career so far. Uh, I started out at uh, the little startup company in the Netherlands called SensorSense, where we developed um, scientific instruments for measuring gases. And uh, we use Haskell as kind of an embedded language uh, to, uh, to control these instruments. So yeah, Haskell as, a, as an as embedded software, that was pretty cool. After that, I moved to Zurich here to work for a company called Better. I think most of you will probably know that company. Uh, we used to organize uh, Zurich Hack also, uh, which was a lot of fun. I had the privilege of working in a really great engineering team. I learned a lot there, uh, especially as a Haskell developer. Um, after that, I went uh, back to uh, the Netherlands uh, to work for a company called LumiGuide that my brother founded about a year earlier, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now I'm a CTO there, so it means I'm kind of the technical guy. Uh, but my brother is actually doing more technical work than I am because 50% of my time I'm also spending on uh, doing business stuff. So I'm wearing many hats. In fact, I'm wearing many suits because <laughs> Uh, part of my time I'm, I'm doing sales, uh, which is kind of a weird combination. Um, so what are we doing? Um, well, we are solving a really Dutch problem. I'm not aware, of, I'm, I'm not sure you, you have this problem in, in Switzerland, uh, but uh, this is a typical site in the Netherlands, uh, typically around train stations, where you see just one, just one pile of bicycles. And so the problem is when you when you go here and you need to catch a train, where do you park your bicycle? Like, where where should it go? Uh, so this is the problem that we're trying to solve. We help you find you, we help you find a place to park your bicycle. Um, and I have a, like a short uh, introduction introduction video that explains uh, our system. It's actually uh, produced by the city of Utrecht. Sorry guys, I'm having troubles making those projectors work, so people who are sitting in front who doesn't have the overhead display probably should move to the back so we can see the presentation actually. Sorry. And I'll wait uh, just a minute for the, for the video. Uh, and you have to excuse me, there are some really bad spelling mistakes in this video. I didn't make it, but... Uh, Somebody screwed up there. Uh, let's see if you can spot them. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Traffic in Utrecht is steadily getting busier. Some hundred thousand cyclists ride through the city center every day, and their number is growing. All these cyclists look for a place to park their bicycle again and again. Utrecht is looking for smart ways to make bicycle parking at the right place easy for cyclists. One of these smart ways is the new P-Route bicycle. Utrecht is the first city in the world where digital signs are used to guide not only motorists, but also cyclists to free parking places.
We hebben installingen die onderdeel zijn van het systeem een meetsysteem aangebracht. Achter mij zie je een sensor hangen, die hangen op een paar meter. Dat systeem meet van elke fietsplek of er een fiets staat. En op die manier weten wij meteen hoeveel plaatsen er beschikbaar zijn. En dat wordt doorgegeven naar de borden langs de fietspaden. Nou, het lijkt me reuze handig om te weten waar de plekken zijn in de stad om de fiets te parkeren. So that was uh, that was a project we did for uh, the city of uh, Utrecht. Uh, after that, we've been uh, quite busy and expanded our, our system to uh, other cities in the Netherlands: uh, city of Amsterdam, city of The Hague, and also our own uh, city of Nijmegen, where we are based. Um, and now we're also expanding internationally to to our neighboring countries: Belgium, uh, UK. Um, so let's move on to something a bit more technical and uh, explain how the system works. So we use these uh, sensors, um, which we mount to the ceiling uh, of uh, facilities. In outdoor facilities, we actually mount these uh, sensors to poles. And yeah, so what are these things? Actually, we call them optical sensors because uh, they basically consist of two security cameras, just off the shelf security cameras, uh, uh, connected to a little switch and then they're like wired together and uh, Yeah, so why do you why do we use two cameras? well, we use stereo vision to See in the third dimension So what, what we do is uh, I have a little picture here of what a typical camera will see um, uh, So what you're seeing here is a two-tier bicycle rack so two rows of bicycles on, on top of each other uh, this is in our outdoor facility. Um, what we do is we draw in these, what we call regions of interest. Oh, I should speak yeah, like this. Um, and um, for in each region of interest, we kind of, we can see in the, in the third dimension, in the, so we can see depth. And when there is no bicycle, we, we don't see an object. And when there is a bicycle or actually something else, uh, it can also be like if there is a, uh, a pile of rubbish or uh, or if there's uh, like these bicycle bags that are in the way we also detect that as an object and then we mark that place as occupied um, it was pretty funny so when we uh, installed the system and uh, opened it turned it on then uh, the next day I got a like on reddit on the Haskell reddit I got a, this reply from Sebastian Visser uh, who works for uh, Silk, this Haskell shop in the Netherlands, uh, and he lives in Utrecht, and he used to park his bicycle there, but uh, uh, yeah, at some point his bicycle was stolen, uh, which is a pretty common thing in the Netherlands, unfortunately, and he asked me, okay, you know, do, do, you, record, uh, do you record the images? But we don't. We, we don't need to record anything, so we, we don't do that uh, for privacy reasons. Uh, but maybe in the future we might actually provide it as an extra service to cities to do also uh, to do also do uh, surveillance. So let's look at a few more pictures. Uh, this is in uh, Nijmegen. Uh, the nice thing about this picture is that you can see that our system also works for kind of rec-free uh, places. Uh, so competing systems they they need to uh, they usually use a switch in the bicycle rack, bicycle rack like a physical switch. Well, if you don't have a rack, then you don't have a place to uh, mount that switch. That's not a problem for us because we just draw in these uh, regions of interest and then we can measure in those regions. So we don't really need a rack. Here's another one uh, from U Utrecht again. And then, uh, so what do we do with that information? Uh, well, we guide cyclists to available space. Uh, in Utrecht, we do that outdoor. We have uh, 52 outdoor displays distributed around the city. And in indoor facilities, this is in The Hague, uh, we use indoor uh, displays that guide people to available space. And then to uh, basically to city officials, we provide management software, uh, which is actually all written in Haskell, at least the backend is. Um, and with this software, they can actually look into their facilities uh, get a like a live overview of, of a facility which places are occupied which are free and of course we produce a lot of data so we can provide nice uh, statistics which they can use to 
kind of inform their policies regarding uh, cycling. So last week we uh, opened uh, a new facility in Amsterdam uh, and I'm really excited about this because this is our first facility that is fully implemented in Haskell. Uh, we used to uh, uh, write our software in Python because Python has, has a really excellent binding to uh, the OpenCV library, uh, this Open Computer Vision library, and uh, which is actually maintained by, maintained by the upstream developers. So we initially chose Python to, to implement our system. But if, if you have a system that is growing and growing and getting more complex, then Python is not the ideal language because you really, really miss static typing. And then you have to write unit tests and stuff like that, and it's just a lot of work. So we decided to uh, switch to Haskell <laughs> and then not write unit tests and just rely on the, on the type system. Um, well, you still, you, still have, you still need to have tests, and we are slowly uh, creating a nice comprehensive test suite. Also, what I really like about this facility is that it's, um, uh, it's completely new, so all the um, sensors are actually mounted into the ceiling. They are integrated into the ceiling, which just looks really, really nice. Uh, this is just a panoramic view that I made uh, last week. Also, the displays that you see in the background are just colored, just green colored matrix displays. And when, when a row is full, it will turn orange, or when it's nearly full, it will turn orange. And then when it's full, it, it's red. We also uh, developed these displays ourselves. They're actually running on Raspberry Pis. And you see an example of a sensor like really integrated into the ceiling. Uh, it just looks beautiful. <laughs> And here you can see like a, the clear size of this facility. It has like space for around 3,000 bicycles. It's really huge. And uh, yeah, there's cameras everywhere, everywhere. So when you're walking through the facility, you're like, oh, Big Brother's watching me, right? Uh, but we don't record anything. Uh, so how, how does it work? Uh, we connect these cameras to uh, an internal uh, network, high-speed network. And we connect them to a local facility server, which is actually doing all the image analysis. Uh, why don't we uh, upload? So we, we could have skipped this facility server, but then, of course, you have to upload all these images through the internet. And then you have pretty huge bandwidth requirements. And these facilities are typically connected to the internet to DSL or 4G. So you really don't want to stream all that stuff over the internet. Uh, so we do, do all the uh, analysis locally and then just upload the measurements to our central uh, cluster. Of course, in rea reality, we, we have multiple facilities, so it looks more like this. Um, a nice thing to mention is that all our uh, systems are running NixOS. Um, if I have time, and I don't think I have time anymore at the end, but uh, then I might talk a bit about how we use Nix to, uh, to power our systems. Okay, let's move slightly to something slightly more technical. Um, one of our, uh, of when, when we deliver uh, a bicycle facility, when we install our cameras, we also need to go through a calibration phase. Every camera, in fact, every bicycle place, every, every region of interest has to be calibrated. Basically what it means is that we have to put uh, the two images of the left and right cameras, we have to like move them on top of each other and then we have to uh, adjust some parameters to calibrate that space. We have to do that for every, every place. Um, we needed a tool for that, so we wrote a web-based tool. Uh, why web-based? Well, uh, we work with a whole team of uh, calibrators, uh, and they work together on, on a facility, and we want to have an uh, easy way to distribute our software, this client, to these calibrators, and then, yeah, what what's easier than just a web client. Uh, so this program was written in uh, Haskell uh, and compiled to JavaScript through uh, GHEJS. One of the libraries that we used uh, to build this tool uh, was actually written by my former colleague, Simon, Simon Meyer. Um, hey, <laughs> thanks, Simon. So this, this was really a great, uh, just, just came in time for us. Uh, I think Simon wrote it for one of the Haskellers meetups here in Zurich, um, and I guess it was just a proof of concept, but it was really, for us, it was just at the right time, and we uh, re pretty much relied our uh, whole, this whole application on the library. Um, 
what is Place React? Well, it basically um, encodes the model view controller pattern in Haskell. So you represent your web application as a value of this data type app. Um, the model is encoded as the state parameter. So as a, as a programmer, you provide an initial state. And this state typically contains all the stuff that is like useful uh, or is needed by that app. For example, this list of sensors that you see on the left, uh, that's, that's part of the state. The values of each uh, text box, um, which tab is selected, all that is part of the state. Secondly, you provide the view. And the view is a, is a function, a render function, from the state to an HTML DOM tree. Forget, forget about the action parameter for a moment. I will explain that. Um, the really nice thing about this function is that it's pure. So there's no I.O. involved. You can't do, you, you can't like connect to, to a database or whatever. It's just a pure function from state to an HTML tree. Um, if you have experience with web development, you might know that when, when you want to change something in your DOM tree, you actually have to mutate the DOM tree. You actually have to maybe remove uh, like a text field and then add in a new new uh, element. Uh, well, you can't really do that here, right? Because it's a pure function. You go from a state to a new HTML tree, which describes your whole um, web application. So how does this work? Well, this Blazor React library, as the name implies, uses the React library on the, uh, internally from, from Facebook. What the library does is uh, you, as a user, you provide a new HTML tree, the, the one that comes from this uh, function. And then uh, the library will actually compare that, diff it, against the current DOM tree, which is running in, in your browser. And then you get a list of patches, and then it will efficiently apply those patches to the current model, and then you have a new one. So that, that's basically, you don't have to think about uh, the old state of the DOM tree. You just have to think about always about the new, the new thing you're going to render. So it's, it's really functional. So what are, what are these actions um, uh, in the uh, DOM tree? Well, if I look here, um, if you have like an input uh, field um, that has an action parameter, what you can do is you can um, add an event handler with the, like on the bottom, you see the on value change. There you can say, okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to assign uh, an action, which is something that the user provides to that input button. So if you, if you, so we go back to this screen. So you see a few input text fields on top. Uh, each of them has an action assigned to it. Assigned to it. For example, the, um, um, uh, for example, the uh, back factor has a back factor input changed um, action uh, assigned to it. When the user actually edits that value, then this action gets uh, fired. Then that action is uh, put into this transition function, the apply action function, which then uh, has to return a function from the old state to the new state. So basically, as a programmer, you provide a state machine. And then when, you, when the, the state has been updated, the render function is called again. And then we go, go around and around and around. That's basically how, it's, how this works. Um, I'm really, uh, yeah, really excited about this library. Uh, and we have been using it uh, in Angular for about a year, and it works really well. The next thing I want to talk about is something completely else. Uh, as I explained, we use OpenCV uh, in our um, uh, facility servers. And we used to implement it in Python, uh, but now we switched to Haskell, so we had to create a binding uh, to OpenCV. Uh, as I explained also in the, in the other room, uh, there are existing bindings to OpenCV, but they are bindings to the old version, the 2.4 version. This is actually the, the, the new version. Uh, we just open sourced it. It's not really uh, officially announced yet. Uh, we might do that at Zurich Hack this, uh, this weekend. Uh, but you can already download the source uh, and make uh, contributions to it. Uh, here you see one of our uh, experiments that we, uh, yeah, where we used our library. Um, here we kind of detect uh, the kind of the depth 
uh, of the, or maybe the, uh, how should I explain the distance from the camera to the first object in sight. Um, yeah, you can clearly see that the bicycle is visible there. What I really like about this example is that you can actually see the the shape of the of the floor going back. So in the front, it's closer to the camera, and then it's going going away. And I, I really like that it's that our algorithm algorithm is able to detect these even the, the 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 textures in the floor. So that's that's pretty cool. This is fully developed in Haskell. Later on, I want to do a, like a little live coding session together with my brother. So we'll... Yeah? Yeah. How are we doing time-wise? Uh, we have 12 minutes. 12 minutes. OK, then I just go very quickly through this. Um, of course, the most uh, important type in a computer vision library is a type for images. And OpenCV actually provides uh, a matrix type for that. Uh, well, we have to wrap that in Haskell. So we provide this um, mod type which is just a form pointer to the internal uh, uh, matrix type from OpenCV. The interesting thing here is uh, we have these uh, phantom types that encode some static uh, information about the images, like the shape, which encodes the dimensions, the number of dimensions of the image, and then for each dimension, the size of that uh, dimension. Uh, the number of channels, for example, if you have a RGB image, you will have three color channels. And then the depth, basically, is the dip, the bit width of the um, uh, of the of each element. It can be eight bits or sixteen bits or floating point, whatever. Um, now, if you look at uh, like a little example function, a decode function, you pass it a byte string, and you get back a matrix. Well, this is pretty difficult. What what do we fill in for these question marks? Well, we don't really know. Uh, well, I should show this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we don't really know what the parameters are uh, statically. We only know it dynamically. So what we've done is we've introduced this, uh, basically this maybe type, or we call it DS, where we can say, OK, um, instead of knowing something statically, we only know it dynamically. And as you can see in the, uh, the decode example, we know statically that the image should have two dimensions, with uh, height and width. But we don't know what the size of that dimension is, so we turn that into D, which means dynamic. Here we see a slightly more involved uh, example. It's called uh, it's a binding to the warp affine function. Um, what this function does is you put in a source image and a transformation matrix, and then it will transform that image according to the matrix. If you forget about these these parameters for a bit and look only at the uh, input parameter and the output output of this function, you can see, OK, we need two dimensions, height and width. Uh, and um, we don't care about the size of these dimensions. It can be dynamic, it can be statically known, but it's fully polymorphic. And, but the really nice thing here is that we can say, OK, the output of this function should have the same dimensions and also the same size of the dimensions as the input. The same thing holds for the channels and depth. They also need to be the same. Uh, the second parameter, this is just transformation matrix. Uh, nice thing is we can use the same data type as for images. They're both just matri matrices. Um, but this should be a two by three affine transformation matrix. And we use this little type family to uh, basically provide a convenience function for uh, mapping this list of two, two uh, comma three to this uh, statically, or this this list of where with all the DS wrappers around it. Um, function, functions can fill in OpenCV, so we catch those exceptions uh, in C++, and then we wrap that in our own uh, exception uh, exception type. Uh, we also have support for mutable matrices because, uh, for example, when you're drawing something, uh, you want to draw to an existing image, and that's of course an a mutable operation. So besides mods, we have uh, mutable matrices, and we can we have conversion functions uh, between them. Or, or we can also convert them uh, in an uns, uns, unsafe manner. Uh, the safe conversion functions they copy the data. Unsafe they don't copy. But then you have to ensure that you're not going to use the mutable matrix uh, after you after you have uh, converted. 
Uh, one of the crucial libraries that we used in this project was Inline C. Uh, it was written by uh, my for former colleague Francesco. Thanks, Francesco. It was a really useful library. What this allows you to do, here we have a small example, it allows you to inline C code or C++ code inside your Haskell code. And it does that using a quasi quote. You see that block uh, quasi quote. You just pass it some C++ code. Uh, and then it, what it will do is it will uh, wrap that code in, in a function, put that function in a C file, uh, and then write, it, it will uh, make a foreign import, FFI import to that function, and uh, call that uh, import at, at that spot in the code. And you can use Haskell values uh, inside the C code. You can splice them in or uh, quote them in. Really, really uh, useful. Yeah, so I, yeah, we had to have a live coding session, but I think I ran out of time. So actually we have an extension of 15 minutes, but I don't think it's enough for the live coding session, but you can fill in things you have skipped. Sure, yeah. Um, so maybe talk about Nix. Yeah, um, yeah, I have a few slides actually about Nix. Um, it's also a functional language. Actually, when we opened our system in Utrecht, I got these nice presents from the uh, Nix OS uh, developers, uh, these nice stickers and co coffee cups. Um, yeah, because we are one of, well, I'm not sure, but we are like a, we are actually using Nix in production and it's pretty uncommon. Uh, so what is Nix? It's a functional language, purely functional, which is really essential to, to Nix. Um, and it's a whole e ecosystem of tools. We have Nix packages. It's a big Git, GitHub repository of uh, expressions, Nix expressions for packaging or for Linux packages and OS X packages. Um, then you have Nix OS, which is a part of the Nix packages uh, repository, um, which is um, a set of modules for configure, configuring a Linux system. And actually, we run uh, NixOS on all our uh, production machines, even on our own workstation. So actually, I, I have here, uh, let's see if that works. No, that doesn't work. Sorry? Oh, yeah. yeah. So here we have um, uh, what we call LumiOS running. It's our own extension to NixOS. Um, yeah, it's uh, basically uh, just an uh, 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 an Xmon uh, a Linux system with Xmonad, and that's what we use to develop our uh, software. Um, here you see one of the examples of our um, uh, OpenCV library. Let's move back. Um, then we use Hydra, which is a continuous integration server based on Nix. It basically pulls in uh, commits that we push to our GitHub repository, then builds everything. It also, also functions as a binary cache. So when my brother implements something, for example, in OpenCV, and uh, pushes that, and when I later pull his commit, I don't have to build everything again because Hydra has already built it, and I can just automatically download it from Hydra. It really speeds up the development. And finally, we use NixOps, which is a deployment tool uh, for deploying code to our uh, network of machines. Uh, well, the really unique thing about Nix is that it doesn't use uh, the traditional uh, file system hierarchy standard, um, but it uses it. It installs software in the in, a, in this thing called the Nix store, and it prefixes every package with a hash, which is basically the hash of the all the inputs to create that uh, package. And, then, and that enables you to actually install multiple versions of the same, for example, software library alongside each other and still be able to, to use one or both uh, at the same time. As I mentioned, we use our own extension to NixOS called LumiOS. Um, yeah, let's skip this for a moment. Yeah, for, for development, we really use uh, Nix Shell, which, really, which brings you into an environment which contains all the um, ex uh, all the dependencies that you uh, that you have that that are required. Yeah, as mentioned, we use Hydra. Uh, Hydra is also configured using a Nix expression, and this here lists all the machines that we have in the field. And then when we um, oh no, sorry, sorry, this this is uh, this, this lists all the the jobs, all the projects that we want to build. 
and Hydra will then build them. And it also contains a nice um, uh, web interface that you can see what, what went wrong. And finally, we use NixOps to then deploy. Um, you pass it uh, a few expressions describing your um, uh, logical configuration of, of the system and the physical configuration. Logical basically means what services should be running on the, on the machines, and the physical configuration explains things like the hardware that you're using, which file systems that you're going to use, uh, and uh, the network settings. And uh, yeah, the nice thing of splitting that up is that you can actually test your system by, in, in a virtual environment by you just you using the same logical co configuration, but swapping the physical configuration for maybe a virtualized environment. And then you can run your complete network in a virtual environment. It's really useful. Yeah, and then we use NixOps to deploy. Uh, and what NixOps will actually do, it will actually also provision machines. For example, if you're on AWS, we aren't currently, we, we use Hetzner, uh, but then NixOps will actually boot or create uh, EC2 machines, uh, install NixOS on them, and then deploy your code to these machines. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe uh, tomorrow or um, so at, at, at the other place we have a table for OpenCV. And uh, yeah, we had scheduled a live coding talk, but my talk just took too long. So uh, maybe we can do it there uh, locally. Uh, and uh, tomorrow here? Or tomorrow here? Yeah. yeah. We actually, we have this room for the whole day tomorrow, so we can easily schedule the live session tomorrow. Super. I think that would be the best. Yeah. Uh, probably sometime along with other talk. Uh, we'll see. Super, yeah. So if anybody has a question, uh, feel free to uh, ask me anything. Yeah. In the graphs uh, you initially showed, uh, the, the num probably it was number of bikes which are part of the number of episodes. Yeah. There were like uh, bleeps there. True. Uh, I think um, this was a picture of the... Um, the yeah, that's actually... Uh, let's 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 move back uh, yeah here this one um, yeah so this is actually one of our facilities that we well, uh, that is not running our system it's running a competing system uh, and we have to interface with that system because it, it's part of the p root bicycle in Utrecht um, these blips that you see here is this other system uses uh, physical switches in the bicycle racks which are wireless switches and they have like um, network problems sometimes. So sometimes the network just malfunctions and then you get these drops in, uh, yeah. So I, I sometimes like to show this example to uh, clients, say well, you shouldn't buy that system, you should buy our, yeah. <laughs> sure. So you could like stereomatically presumably have that. Yep. And I was like panoramic cameras, where they like, uh, so how do you do this very much? Do you do it in ASCII? Do you use OpenCV? Like yeah, we use, we use OpenCV. And uh, of course, we have an algorithm uh, but that just calls functions from OpenCV. And we just use that in a clever okay. way. Are they cameras or are they like no, they're, they're really simple, standard, off the shelf, uh, 80 degree cameras. Okay. Um, yeah. So why is that thing round? Oh, yeah, the one in one of the screenshots. Yeah, uh, we used to use these 360 degree cameras because um, they allow you to put a camera in the middle of a row and then you can see the right side and the left side and you don't have to buy two separate units. Yeah. So, uh, but we, we're not really happy with 360 degree cameras because the, 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 where you do the measurements is actually in the, in the far edges of the screen, right. which contains the least amount of pixels. Right. So that's uh, because of the distortion, uh, because of the lens basically. But to do this fair matching there, what you do you like? No, we actually we use the same uh, okay, the same algorithm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. What is your impression um, the reaction being from the cities when you tell them that this is made in Haskell? Does it be like this is not C sharp or is not something like? Well, we, we don't tell them. I mean, they, they don't care. <laughs> 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 yeah, they really because we kind of provide the system as a service. We also we run it in our own cloud service. 
and they just care about that it works, and they don't care. Uh, they don't, don't care that it's implemented in uh, in Haskell. Well, yeah, they do. They do care about the size of the company because yeah. you, these are big European tenders that you have to go through uh, because these are really yeah, costly pro projects. They're like in the one hundred thousand to four hundred thousand range, or maybe even half a million. Um, so you have to go through a tender, and then you have to show that you are like a healthy company. Um, and you can do that, for example, by par partnering with bigger companies. Um, we have done it in the past, yeah. Yes? Uh, do you throw in like the rack area by hand? Yeah, yeah, we do, we do. At the moment, so we are working on a new um, improved version of this, uh, where we actually, because one of the big problems is when, when you actually, you have to draw all these things by hand and then for every region of interest you have to do a calibration step which might take like two to three minutes per uh, per place uh, actually you need to put a bike in there to uh, to uh, to actually calibrate it correctly so we also have like a physical person there puts in a bike and then and then we at our office we we calibrate it and then we tell them okay move to the next one it's a lot of work uh, and that's also a costly part of our, of our solution, and we are now trying to automate that by basically providing a, developing a three-dimensional model of your facility and then using that model to do the calibration. And we are now working on that. Yeah. What are like the uh, production parameters? How much TPS do you have? How much connections do you have? How much data do you uh, go through every day? Um, so for the central servers, uh, not that much because we just upload measurements to that. Uh, and well, do you know how many measurements we have? Maybe. Per, yeah, I have lots uh, of measurements. The only upload is a change. Once it's occupied, it's occupied, it's occupied. You only say if it's a state change, you upload a state change. And they have now some like 10, 12 facilities. Yeah. But uh, they have like a lot of different things. They have the same thing for the facilities. Uh, yeah, with a few million rows of data, yeah. which is of more than a year, so it's pretty mild actually. Yeah. How fast do you react to the change? Uh, yeah, now with the, with the Python uh, version, it's like uh, within a minute, and now with the Haskell version, it's uh, down to 20 to 10 seconds, and it can easily improve in all the factors 20 to 40, I think. But that's already way quicker than what is needed. Uh, the city just care that it's gets done in like uh, 50 seconds or something. Um, yeah. Sure. Sorry, your, your problem seems very general. Have you considered uh, using it for the parts? Because it seems much simpler. The yeah. bike is very complicated. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we actually, Lumiguide started out as a car detection company. Uh, um, and then later we switched to bicycles because that was really a niche market that nobody was, uh, uh, was active in. Um, and um, for cars, we use we, we used to use um, uh, sonar uh, technology or uh, ultrasound. So we emit a sound wave, and then the echo comes back, and then we know something is under that sensor. Um, that didn't work for bicycles, uh, so we switched to uh, to an optical system. But now we're also actively using that optical systems to, to, to detect by uh, cars again. We have just like in the beginning of this year, we have deployed in Amsterdam uh, an outdoor parking facility for cars using the same technology as uh, for bikes. Yeah. And it's actually, it's indeed easier to de de detect cars because they're bigger and yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, how do you handle uh, people actually throwing the bikes into the rack? You yeah, that's a good question. The, yeah. The, yeah, if somebody is standing in front of your region of interest, then you can't see it, right? Uh, so we 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 can de we detect that that somebody is standing in front because we can see. Okay, we see an object, but it's it's in front of the area that we are interested in. When we detect that, we stop we stop measuring for for a. Uh, uh, we basically uh, we we don't update that spot. So as long as somebody is in front. Uh, we don't update, but then when he walks away, we can see it again, and then uh, you measure. And usually, people are not standing uh, for a long time uh, in the same place in the facility because they park the bikes and they walk away. So it's not really a problem. But you do have to detect it; otherwise, the, the, 
when people are working in front, your your measurements uh, will like flip around. Uh, yeah. Yes. Sure. Are the slides online? Uh, they will be. Yeah. Yeah. They will be at the I think at the GitHub repository of the Haskellus group here. Yeah. Okay. Oh yes. David. Why didn't you try something simpler, such as, you know, if you close the rack with flags popping up that you can easily detect with computer vision? I mean, I imagine ah. it's much harder to detect an actual bite, which is this you know yeah. wiry thing of how to detect little details. Yeah, so with the like with a physical flag, you mean, right? Um yeah. I'm actually uh, competing uh, products do that well they don't actually detect the flag they just use a flag to indicate okay this place is like occupied of course you don't then don't have that information digitally available and uh, you can't like put that on this place uh, but of course the disadvantage of a, like a physical solution is that you actually have to uh, mount that to the bicycle rack and there are multiple types of different racks and then you have to provide like a mounting solution for every rack and that's really involved. That's also one of the reasons we don't use physical switches because that's what our competitor, competitor is using. But then you also have to write, make custom mounts for every type of diff, different bicycle rack. Uh, and we kind of, we, we're also telling cities the advantage of our system is that it's completely independent of the bicycle rack. You can if you you don't even need a bicycle rack, even like free free spots. Do you have any measurements in the areas where just bicycles are standing like randomly, like in the street? Uh, no, we, we don't. But you, of okay, course, you starting yeah. on the city of respect where we have uh, situations like that. Yeah, we are, we're starting to do it. And but uh, the interesting thing is, you can also reverse the system. For example, when you have like an emergency door in a facility, it's important that there are no bicycles in front of that door, right? Because when a fire breaks out, people have to move through that door. So what we can do is we can throw in a region of interest f before that door and then uh, basically reverse the system. So when something is in there, we m notify the, uh, the guard and then he can remove the bicycle. And then it works in, in the reverse way, yeah. <clears throat> yes. And you want to protect the bicycles? Yes, yes, abandoned bicycles, yes. Yeah. We do that. That's one, one the, the, the additional feature of our system. It's one for guiding cyclists, but indeed the other is uh, detecting what we call orphaned bicycles. And it's really a big problem in the Netherlands. Like 20% of each facility is occupied by bikes that are never collected again. And that's, uh, and if you realize that uh, to build a bicycle, one place, one one place is like three thousand euros, uh, and uh, yeah, this facility here is like three thousand places. Yeah, so that's a huge amount of like twenty percent is is a huge amount, and uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we have to uh, maybe one more question, and then uh, yes, in the back. Just want to say maybe you should make an app for thieves that guides them to those. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. <laughs>